You know, in a movie that's wild enough to include a T-Rex Spider-Man, a Cat Spider-Man, a Lego Spider-Man, and Peter Parked Car the Spider-Mobile, you think they'd be smart enough to include literally the single best Spider-Man ever put to screen. I am, of course, talking about Supaita Man, the Japanese Sentai Spider-Man with the single best costume, a giant robot. He's also got himself a theme song that slaps. <laughs> We were robbed, I tell you. Robbed. Robbed! Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that'll put its hand on your shoulder and say, Hey. So, Spider-Man's kind of in an interesting spot in cinema, isn't he? The whole franchise has some of the best, as well as some of the worst superhero movies ever made, even if the memes are always top shelf. Look at little Goblin Jr. Gonna cry. But one movie I don't think anyone saw going as hard as it did, 2018's animated Into the Spider-Verse, telling the story of Miles Morales as he takes up the mantle of Spider-Man after his Peter Parker is killed. Thankfully, he gets himself a ton of help figuring out what to do in the form of Spider-People from various different universes dragged into Miles' dimension by the movie's big bad. What felt like it could easily have been a cynical cash grab turned out to exceed everyone's expectations. It's considered to be one of the best, if not the single best Spider-Man movie ever made. Made. It's beloved by critics, it made a killing at the box office, it won all the awards. So when we all heard that it was getting a pair of sequels and across and beyond the Spider-Verse, let's just say that those movies had a lot to live up to. And thankfully, the recently released Across the Spider-Verse is great. Seriously, when this movie first got teased, I was concerned that it was just going to turn into a cameo fest with too much fan service. And while it did lean in more on the cameos and fan service than the previous one, it also managed to be a worthy sequel to one of the best superhero films ever made. Even if that cliffhanger at the end did leave me a little bit disappointed. Also, I don't think this was a problem with the movie, but just one with the theaters that I saw it in having really bad audio mixing. I had a hard time hearing a lot of Gwen and Hobie's dialogue at various points. I thought it was just a me thing. You know, I am getting older these days, maybe my hearing's going, but then I started seeing other people bringing it up online. Anyway, here's hoping that they get the whole thing resolved. Even considering those minor hiccups though, the movie was a visual masterpiece, throwing us into multiple new universes and showing us hundreds, literal hundreds of new Spider-Men, each with their own unique visual aesthetics and styles. For me, the standouts had to be Spider-Gwen's watercolor world and the incredible 80s paper cutout animations of Spider-Punk. Also, biggest laugh clearly goes to the Lego universe, which turns out was animated by a 14-year-old? <laughs> Kids these days, man. You guys are so talented. Without a doubt, Across the Spider-Verse took all the ideas from the first film and turned them up to 11. Spoiler warning for Across the Spider-Verse in case you didn't figure it out by this point. After the events of several recent movies, including Into the Spider-Verse, Spider-Man No Way Home, and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, which yes, Doctor Strange is specifically called out in this movie. Don't even get me started on Doctor Strange and the little nerd back on Earth 1999-99. Holes have started showing up throughout the multiverse. These have let bad guys slip into alternate dimensions and wreak havoc. In response, Miguel O'Hara, the sci-fi Spider-Man 2099, has set up the Spider Society to help police the multiverse and bring all these villains home. But when Miles wants to join the Spider Society, Miguel refuses him at every step, because Miles is actually part of the problem. He unintentionally created the Spot, a multi-dimensional villain, and the events of Into the Spider-Verse were never supposed to happen. Miles was not supposed to be bitten by the radioactive spider. His world's Peter Parker was not supposed to die. Miles was never supposed to take on the role of Spider-Man in the first place. What's even worse, that spider that bit Miles wasn't even from his universe. So Miles is the original anomaly that started knocking over all these dominoes. So to help set things straight, Miguel and his Spider Society are trying their best to, quote, restore the canon. To make things right by ensuring that the big events that are supposed to happen to every Spider-Man across every world actually happen. And if they don't, well then the multiverse itself could collapse. You know, no pressure. But, see loyal theorists, I have a problem with his line logic. It doesn't sit right with me given everything that we see both in this movie and throughout the wider multiverse that this movie sits within. I think Miguel is making a huge mistake here. I think he's wrong about the whole canon events thing. I also think he's wrong about Miles being the real danger of all of this. And that error is ultimately going to destroy everything that we love about every superhero movie if they don't set things right. We're not only looking at the collapse of the Spider-Verse here, we are looking at the end of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So change into your spider Sony 
known as friends and let's swing into it. Within the film, we're introduced to the idea of canon events. According to Miguel, these are fixed events in time that must happen for a universe to remain stable. Basically, it's the explanation for why so many different versions of Spider-Man across so many different stories all experience the same things. They had to happen for that universe to exist. Now, they don't outright give us an explicit list of canon events that have to occur for all the Spider-Man, but they do show us images of several others within the web of life and destiny. The ones I spotted included a spider bite giving someone superpowers, the death of an Uncle Ben-esque figure, teaching Spider-Man the lesson that with great power comes great responsibility, connecting with a love interest, sometimes with an upside-down kiss in the rain, a wedding to a love interest, a symbiote creating a nemesis, throwing the Spider-Man costume away, and being crushed by rubble before finding the strength to lift it. Gwen also mentions that in every other universe, Gwen Stacy falls for Spider-Man, and in every universe it doesn't work out, so that one may or may not be a canon event as well. But the big one, the one that applies the most to this particular story, a police captain close to Spider-Man dies, usually by trying to save a child from falling debris. This is where the main conflict of the story comes in. Miles' dad is about to be sworn in as captain of the NYPD, and obviously he doesn't want his dad to die, but you apparently can't bypass a canon event, and Miguel refuses to let Miles leave to save his father's life. This is something that Miguel had to learn the hard way. According to Miguel, he wanted to be happy with a family, and so he found himself a universe where that universe's version of him had been killed. He then stepped in and secretly replaced his dead self. It sounds complicated, but basically he just pulled a Rick and Morty. In fact, if we're being honest, this whole movie is just pulling one big Rick and Morty, Spider Society, Citadel of Ricks much. It's not a bad thing, I'm just saying. Anyway, Miguel stepping in was an issue since his death was considered to be a canon event in that timeline, leading to that universe collapsing. People were erased from existence, including Miguel's daughter, who disappeared in his arms. By the end of it all, the universe was gone, leaving Miguel devastated and determined to make sure that it never happened again. This threat also checks out in the movie, too. As soon as Miles saves Captain Singin' Mumbatton and bypasses the canon event there, a dark hole starts swallowing up that world. All of this sets up a great conflict between Miles and Miguel for the rest of the movie. Just like Miles, we don't want his dad to die. But just like Miguel, we don't want that universe to collapse either. But here's the thing. When I really sat down and started thinking about this, the whole canon events thing, I'm not buying it. First of all, I have a lot of questions about Miguel's story here. He claims that the universe with his family collapsed because he bypassed a canon event. So, does that mean that Miguel's death was a canon event? But who then was it a canon event for? Was he the Uncle Ben or the police captain in this situation? Or was he just some random guy? Was he the Spider-Man of that world? He has the powers in the title after all. Would that then mean that Spider-Man's death is a canon event? That shouldn't be the case since Miguel later yells at Miles for getting the Spider-Man of his world killed. And considering how much Marvel, Disney, and Sony want to milk this character until the end of time, some tells me that Spider-Man's death is not going to be a corporate approved canon event that's going to happen all the time. Additionally, how many times has Miguel seen this actually happen? We only see the one instance, so is Miguel working with a data set of just one? That isn't enough test cases to make such a weird multiversal big brother organization that's okay with so many people dying. In short, it doesn't make sense, and the other canon events start falling apart too when you really look at them. Like, speaking of Miles getting his Peter Parker killed, didn't that disrupt every other canon event of Miles' universe? Shouldn't that universe have imploded? Or is that universe self-correcting around Miles? Given how much of an anomaly Miguel makes Miles out to be, that probably shouldn't be the case if Miguel is truly right in his hypothesis. Another easy example would be the symbiote attaching to someone and becoming a nemesis for Spider-Man. What's the problem here? Well, Across the Spider-Verse features a moment where the spot briefly pops into the universe of the Tom Hardy Venom movies to steal some gum, but it doesn't seem like there's a Spider-Man in the Venom-verse for Eddie Brock to butt heads with. Considering Eddie doesn't react to Spider-Man being unmasked when he briefly crossed over into the MCU during the post credit scene for Let There Be Carnage. Another example would be Spider-Man connecting with and marrying their love interest. This problem comes with the Amazing Spider-Man films, which are directly connected to this universe through a cameo with Andrew Garfield. Sure, he fell in love with Gwen Stacy in his world, but after her death, he focuses all of his time and energy into being Spider-Man, as he explains in No Way Home. You have someone? Yeah. I got no time for, uh, Peter Parker stuff. That is years without a love interest, without building any sort of a relationship, without a wedding, etc, etc. And yet, as far as we can tell, the world of the Amazing Spider-Man still hasn't collapsed nearly a decade after we last saw it. Thirdly, we gotta talk about the Uncle Ben moment. This death is supposed to be a massive world-shaking event that sets Spider-Man on his path, teaching him all about power and responsibility. Now, it doesn't literally need to be a Ben Parker who dies. For Miles, it was Uncle Aaron. For Gwen, it was her friend Peter Parker. For Miguel, it looks like it was his daughter. But here's the issue that I find with all of this. 
Tom Holland's Peter Parker operates as Spider-Man in the MCU for literal actual years before he eventually has his Uncle Ben moment. Just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, the writers of the MCU Spider-Man movies have stated that Uncle Ben's death in the MCU did happen, but it didn't have the same impact on Holland's Peter Parker as the others across the multiverse. Instead, the importance of this moment was shifted onto Aunt May in Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, you might be thinking, hey, it happens eventually, so we're all good, but are we just gonna ignore the timeline here? In every other dimension that we've ever seen ever, this Uncle Ben moment happens within months, even days after he's bitten by the spider. And across the Spider-Verse, Pavita Prabhakar has been operating as Spider-Man for just six months, and clearly he's already had his Uncle Ben moment. The Maguire, Garfield, and Miles Morales Spider-Man have all had their uncles die within just days of getting bit. And yet, the MCU isn't on the brink of collapse because Spider-Man hasn't had his Uncle Ben moment as quickly as all the other universes. But the thing that really drove the nail into the coffin for me, one of the biggest of these so-called canon events has to be a spider biting someone and giving them powers. So that universe has a Spider-Man to begin with, right? Well, we see the spider bite as the first canon event that's explained to Miles. And yet, at the end of the movie, when we visit Earth-42, the world where Miles' spider came from, that doesn't have a Spider-Man. And it's still there. Sure, it's not in great shape. There's a lot of crime, a sinister six cartel that seems to be running things, massive fires throughout all of New York City, but the world itself has not collapsed. Now, I can already hear plenty of you furiously typing away in the comments. Just because these canon events haven't happened yet in these worlds doesn't mean they won't happen. And the order of the canon events doesn't necessarily need to be the same every time. And believe me, I hear you. That was one of my initial thoughts when I was crafting this theory too. But again, it doesn't line up with what we see in the movie. All thanks to that necessary death of a police captain close to Spider-Man bit that drives the whole conflict. Remember, Mumbatton starts collapsing immediately after Miles saves Captain Singh. Literal seconds after that event. If canon events don't have to happen at specific times, couldn't Captain Singh or another captain have just died later in the story of that world? And yet, here's Miles' world, which is totally fine. It didn't collapse when Peter Parker died. All of this tells me that what the movie says about canon events and the fallout of breaking canon is wrong. Miguel has misidentified the problem. What we're seeing in these movies isn't the breaking of canon, it's incursions, just like we've been seeing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that is way, way worse than any of these Spider-Men think it is. Now, if you dropped off the main MCU after Endgame, you might not know what I'm talking about here. We first learn about incursions in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, when Strange is brought before the Illuminati of Earth-838. Steven, your arrival here confuses and destabilizes reality. The larger the footprint you leave behind, the greater the risk of an incursion. Basically, when people from one universe cross into another, the two universes start getting pulled together. Everything starts breaking down until at least one of the universes is torn apart at the seams, killing everyone in it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? This is an incursion, and they are no joke. We see what's left of a universe after its incursion, and it's a wasteland. It is a void of nothingness. This is such a big threat that the Illuminati think Doctor Strange merely existing in their universe is a major risk, and that he needs to be dealt with. But hold on, why am I connecting this movie to the MCU? Sony is the one that's making the Spider-Verse films, not Marvel. And that's correct. But Spider-Verse goes well out of its way to make sure that there is a connection established to the MCU. And it's not a blink and you miss it cameo or offhanded reference either. Like I said at the top of the episode, Miguel straight up references the events of No Way Home and Multiverse of Madness within the first 15 minutes of this movie. Don't even get me started on Doctor Strange and the little nerd back on Earth 1999-99. Earth 1999 999 is a designation of the MCU in Marvel Multimedia, first called out in the official handbook of the Marvel Universe A to Z. No Way Home connected the older Sony films to the MCU multiverse, so the projections of both Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man also connect this movie to them too. The Spot briefly visits Mrs. Chen from the Venom movies, a world also connected through No Way Home, and Donald Glover cameos as a variant of Uncle Aaron suited up as the Prowler, the same role that we see him play in the MCU. But the linchpin that 100% slots this into the Marvel Cinematic Multiverse now, when Miguel begins his explanation of the Spider-Verse to Miles, he projects a simulation of the multiverse. One that looks exactly like how the multiverse has been portrayed throughout the MCU. And I'm not just talking, oh, it kind of looks like it if you squint at it, I guess. This is exactly the same glowing, glimmering white threads branching off into multiple timelines, just like what we saw in Loki, just like what we saw in Quantumania. Having all of these connections to the MCU, positioning this as part of the wider Marvel Cinematic franchise, means that we have to bring in the MCU logic here. Sony can't have their MCU cake and eat it too, even if they do buy two cakes. If people from one universe crossing over into another universe is something that causes incursions, that is what we're seeing in this franchise. And it explains everything. It solves all of the issues that we've been having. When Miguel crossed over into that other universe where he died so he could live a happy life with his family, he caused that world to be erased through an incursion.
incursion. It explains why Earth 42, the world without a Spider-Man because our Miles got bit by its spider is totally fine despite it breaking canon. No extra dimensional visitors have spent any significant time there, thereby avoiding an incursion. It also explains what's happening in Mumbatan. Miles, Gwen, Spider-Punk, and the Spot basically destroy a massive stretch of the city, leaving a giant footprint behind. The hole that opens up in Mumbatan is the beginnings of an incursion, one that the Spider Society is arguably making worse by trying to fix. And that's the bitter irony in all of this. In Miguel's desire to try and fix the problem that he wrongly identifies as breaking the canon, what's he do? He gathers spider people from across the multiverse into one place, and then he sends them on missions to realities that aren't their own. Every single time that he does that, the Spider Society is risking another massive series of these universe-ending events. In short, by trying to help the situation, by forcing things to fit a proper mold to be the right, correct way, Miguel has made it exponentially worse, not only increasing the risk of incursions happening throughout the multiverse, but by indoctrinating a literal army of spider people into simply standing by while innocent victims die. All in preservation of things being done the right way, the correct way. And thematically, this theory makes a lot of sense. The story that I suspect that the Spider-Verse franchise is trying to tell us is that anyone can be Spider-Man, but that everyone is gonna be doing it their own way. Everyone is gonna be doing it a little differently. Everyone's gonna carry that responsibility differently. But that doesn't mean that they're doing it wrong. You are your own person, and you can choose your destiny. You are not the product of a bunch of events that came before you. Miguel getting angry at Miles for messing up how things are supposed to happen, yelling at him because he's not supposed to be a Spider-Man, that could be a stand-in for a lot of the audience resistant to change. An audience who wants to see the same stories playing out over and over again the right way. Or, that can also be a stand-in for where we are in society today, where certain classes of people are allowed to do things with their lives that others aren't just because they're right or correct. Just like how certain people can and can't be Spider-Man in Miguel's eyes. But Miles turns that entire idea on its head. Being told that he isn't supposed to be Spider-Man gives Miles the freedom, the permission to stop trying to be Spider-Man. To stop trying to think about what Peter Parker or Miguel O'Hara or Gwen Stacy would do, and instead to just be himself, to just be Miles. Like he says in this moment, Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah. I'm gonna do my own thing. And that right there, that is the most heroic lesson that any Spider-Man across any of the universes can possibly teach. But hey, being Spider-Man has to be rough on the body, especially with that summer heat coming up. Miles, Peter, Gwen, Miguel, they all need to stay hydrated to make sure they can fight regardless of the universe that they're in. And it's never been easier to do that than with today's sponsor, Air Up. If you've been watching any of the theory channels over the past year, you'll know that everyone here on the team loves these Air Up bottles. Basically, they give you a tasting superpowers. They change the way that regular old H2O tastes without adding any calories or chemicals to the water. You just pop on one of Air Up's flavor pods onto the bottle and bam, suddenly you're tasting blueberry or cherry, all without the risk of getting bit by a radioactive spider. Personally, over the last couple months, I've been stocking up on all the summery flavors, like watermelon or lemon or lemon basil. All the things that remind me of the nostalgic summer parties that we would have in our backyard with my family as a kid. Air Up isn't some super advanced sci-fi tech from another dimension where water tastes different from our world. It actually uses real science to trick your brain, taking advantage of the connection between our senses of taste and smell. By inhaling the scents from the flavor pods, you're more or less injecting that flavor into the water using nothing but your brain. And that right there, that is some pretty awesome tech. Arab also recently added new steel bottles to their lineup, so you have yourself a durable metal bottle that stays insulated to take on any hikes or outdoor adventures this summer. It also has a larger capacity, which, as someone who drinks a lot of fluids, I really appreciate. So if you want to up your water drinking game, why not go grab yourself your very own Air Up bottle and flavor pods? As a special bonus, you can get a 20% discount off your entire purchase when you use the code Film Theory at checkout, or by clicking the link in the top line of the description. Again, that is 20% off your entire dang purchase by using the code F-I-L-M-T-H-E-O-R-Y, or just by clicking the link in the description. Thank you again to Air Up for sponsoring today's episode, and as always, remember, it's all just a theory. A film theory! And cut!